This is Wardeg Street, where I was born. It was the swinging 60s. Everything was in black and white, and the Beatles were everywhere. Me and my mates decided at the age of four to pretend to be the Beatles. I remember complaining that my guitar didn't work, as I used to think they played by themselves. My father used to work nights, and so mum used to drag me to the cinema to see films. I remember A Hard Day's Night by The Beatles. Some bloke with a wobbly leg and jelly hips. And of course, Cliff Richard and the young ones. No, not them. Big Butch one. The young one. Darling, we're the young ones. Shouldn't be afraid. My mother is a big John Wayne fan. Get on your horse. We'll be back. She went on to say John Wayne was the greatest actor in the world. Which will it be? Fill your hand, you son of a bitch! Well, there's no arguing with that. This is the house my family moved to in the mid-60s. Flower power was still in bloom and the moon programme was always in the news. I was nearly seven and looked like a young Steve McQueen in short trousers and along with my rally three-gear bike I was destined to be a heartbreaker. One Christmas I saw The Great Escape. I didn't see what was so great about it, as only three escaped. But it did confirm one suspicion. The Germans were very naughty. As my dad was on shifts, he also got to take me to the cinema. He took me to see Lawrence of Arabia. Film producers today say young people wouldn't put up with a long shot like this today. Rubbish. I was only eight and was spellbound by this scene. He also took me to see 2001, A Space Odyssey. I was a bit confused with all the monkeys at the beginning, but I loved the spaceships and how. But what about that ending? I said, Dad, what was that ending all about? He said, do you want fish and chips for your supper? Still the best answer I've had to that question to this very day. But it was here that I saw the first film that really excited me and more importantly changed my thinking about girls. The apparatus was kicking in, and it was very embarrassing watching Bond messing around with all those girls when I was sitting next to my parents. Bond was great, but I wish he would get up and kill some baddies instead of lazing around with all those girlies. And on taxpayers' money. The Daily Mail would never have approved. That makes two of us. That's more like it. We met some girls in a playing field. They didn't know what the offside trap was. And when I told them I could bowl a googly, they laughed and said they liked to kick them. How naive. We took them on at football and showed them that boys were best by beating them 10-0 until they ran away with a ball. I chased them, and that's where they demonstrated what they meant by kicking a googly. 
There was Jane, Leslie, Ruth and Liz. I thought Liz was more beautiful than Ingrid Bergman. She was younger and in colour for a start. Play as time goes by. You must remember this. A kiss is just a kiss. A sigh is just a sigh. The fundamental things apply as time goes by. One morning, I saw her on the school bus, and she waved to me. E! I waved back. I couldn't believe it. Every morning, she would wave, and her wave sent me to heaven. I was walking on air. The sky was permanently blue, the clouds dazzlingly white. I was dancing on daffodils. So there was a point to adolescence. I had to tie my walks to school to coincide with Liz's bus. My friends soon got fed up. I did everything I could to impress her, especially now as I had a bike with five gears. The problem was, I didn't have a clue how to talk to girls. Instead, I talked about how wonderful I was. I even told her I came first in a maths test. I bet she was so impressed she had trouble getting to sleep that night. Adolf Hitler said, the bigger the lie, the more people believe it. Well, I did lie. I came second in that maths test and I cheated. After a week of bragging about coming first in English, history and physics, Liz was no closer to becoming my girlfriend. It looked like I had backed a loser trying to get dating tips from Hitler's book. The critics were right. Mein Kempf is a load of rubbish. I was much too shy to ask her out, and so I slowly had to build up my resolve. Muster all my courage and be strong. And I got one of my friends to ask her. The only trouble was my one friend turned out to be a horde of thousands. We agreed by mutual consent that it was best we didn't date. That or she thought I was an ugly frog with warts and bad breath. I can't remember which. Honest. The next day, she passed me on the school bus and stuck two fingers up, which went straight through my heart. broken for the first time and I seriously contemplated taking an overdose of junior aspirin. Of all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world, she walks into mine. Luckily, a saviour was on the TV. I looked on and I slowly began to cheer up. I said to myself, yeah, who needs girls when you've got the Flintstones? I still didn't give up on Liz though. I had been brought up on films where the boy always gets the girl and I really believe no, that life was like that. No, you still lived in Liz, my husband. And was, even when I knew you in Paris. Where the cavalry always comes at the last moment.
where women and children were always safe from disaster. Okay, bad examples, but I still believed in the magic of film. I still believed that good would prevail, and I still believed they should ban popcorn from cinemas. But it wasn't to be. Liz moved without saying where she was going. She was gone forever. I had only one conceivable chance of seeing her again, and that was when we were both in heaven. I suddenly thought, knowing my luck, Liz would die early in some tragic car accident, leaving me down here alone for at least forty years. In that time, she was bound to meet someone else. To find her. Her dad was a nuclear engineer, so they could have moved anywhere Rio, Jamaica, or Sydney. I had the smart idea of asking her neighbours where she had moved to. It wasn't Rio, Sydney, or Jamaica. It was here, ten miles from my home about an hour on my new 10-gear bike. I searched the Burfield Common road by road, bunking off school even to succeed in my quest. After days of searching and a detention for skipping school, I spied Liz's dad's silver Ford Zodiac at number 10 Woodlands Avenue. Being too shy to knock on her door, I went through the phone book number by number, to be able to talk to her. We eventually met, and away from the peer pressure, she was pleased to see me, and we become friends. Come up and see me. film and 
went to see Taron Inferno and watched Shenandoah on the TV. We did an in-depth critical analysis on both and came to the conclusion that they were good. But it wasn't to last. Lizzie's father had got a temporary job in Jamaica, which meant she would be leaving England for six months. We said our goodbyes and she promised to phone me the moment she returned. I've got a job to do too. Where I'm going, you can't follow. What I've got to do, you can't be any part of. Ilza, I'm no good at being noble, but it doesn't take much to see that the problems of three little people don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. Someday you'll understand that. Now, now. He's looking at you, kid. In the meantime, I decided to become a rock star. I would have fame, fortune, and lots of girls to play Monopoly with. That would surely impress her. I learnt to play the guitar and formed my first band called Doobry and the Wise Guys. I designed the band's logo along with posters for our upcoming gigs and the design for the cover of our inevitable first LP. Although I preferred the other names that were suggested, like Grit Pop McDougal and the Afghanistani Banjo Boys, or the Unfinished Lobotomies. Behind me is the church where our rock band rivals played in 1975. The same year, Led Zeppelin sold out Earl's Court for a record five times. Led Zeppelin were my favourite band because Lizzie's brother liked them. I liked the song Custard Pie and was shocked to find out the song wasn't about pie shops. In 1976, the Rolling Stones played Earl's Court six times, just to get one over Zeppelin. I thought Mick Jagger was too old. I he was nearly 30. So our band decided to do the same and get one over our rivals and play the church not once, but twice. Our rivals went on to open the Reading Festival and play in Wardour Street in London. We made it all the way to Acton, Working Man Social Club. So both successful in our own way, girls wanted to hear disco music and the boys were envious of all the attention we were getting. I played See Emily Play and dedicated it to Liz. The next day, I was at school playing cricket for Abbey House and I scored a huge 38 not out. It 
It seemed everybody wanted to know me, and if they didn't like my cricket, they liked my band. I was the greatest, the bee's knees. I was King Kong. My head swelled to the size of a Zeppelin airship. 1937. I needed to be with people who were as magnificent as myself. And as that simply wasn't possible, I decided to walk home for lunch alone. I wondered about the title of my autobiography and was stuck between the greatest living Englishman and how dare I be so wonderful. I crossed the road and then suddenly I saw Liz. It was Liz. She hadn't phoned me. I mouthed, where are you living? And she pointed behind her. I then made the actions for her to phone me as, as soon as possible. She nodded yes. moved back to England, to this house, and she never did call. A friend called Peter Clark used to play with Liz's younger sister, Catherine, in a huge field with this huge conch tree in it. The last time I saw Liz was about a year later, at what used to be the top-ranked nightclub. We talked amicably, and her elder sister, Eleanor, bought me a pint. I was always scared of Eleanor. She was strikingly beautiful and two whole years older than me. They were going to meet the Knott Brothers, who made Narcissus look like a part-timer. Typical Liz, always settling for second base. I know I'll make it easier for you. Go ahead and shoot. You'll be doing me a favour. And that was the last time I ever saw her. They say that the only true love is the one that remains unrequited. But I think that's a saying made up by sore losers. I also realised you couldn't make people love you, even if you had a 20 gear racing bike. She was my reluctant muse and I was her fool. But if it was not for her, I wouldn't have had my love of music, paintings and films. It was the start of a beautiful friendship. Our expenses. Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Yeah, I just said that.